Well, apologies for that. This is Business Incorporated. And on the program today, 55 minutes of going around the world of business. Here's what's coming your way. There's an NPC meeting going on at this time. The decision will be made tomorrow. Stay, stay tuned right here. We'll bring that to you. And in Senegal, as results trickle in, we see their bonds sink. National Bank of Kenya. There's some controversies around that. We'll give you the details on this program. Good afternoon. Welcome to Business Incorporated. I'm Amini John McCoy. Well, let's start as usual. <laughs> Doesn't matter how we start, but we're heading to the global business space now. Oil prices rose in Asian trading on Monday and concerns of a tighter global supply brought about by escalating conflicts in the Middle East and between Russia and Ukraine, while a shrinking U.S. rig count added to the upward price pressure. Brent crude features climbed 39 cents, or 0.5%, to 85 dollars 82 cents a barrel, while U.S. crude features gained 40 cents, that's 0.5%, also 81 dollars 3 cents a barrel. Both benchmarks fell less than 1% last week versus the previous week. A stronger U.S. dollar, which rose about 1% over the last week, has kept a lid on prices. Meanwhile, the U.S. Uh, oil rig count fell by 1 to 509 last week. Also, other factors. Moscow launched 57 missiles and drones in the attack that also targeted the capital, Kiev, two days after the largest aerial bombardment of Ukraine's energy system in more than two years of full-scale attacks. In the, in the grain space, now Chicago wheat features rose to a three-week high on Monday and concerns over the brand of French crop and tensions in the Black Sea, although ample supply kept prices near multi-year lows. Soybean and corn features fell slightly. The most active wheat contract on the Chicago Board of Trade was up 0.4% to $5.56 for three-quarter of a bushel after touching $5.60 in early trade, its highest since March the 5th. Uh, like wheat, these contracts have risen in recent weeks from their lowest levels since 2020, and investors remain bearish. In a metal space, gold prices edge higher Monday as renewed bets that the United States Federal Reserve could begin cutting interest rates in June. As spot gold was up 0.3% at $2,169.69 per ounce, the U.S. gold features climbed 0.5% to $2,171.10 per ounce, and gold prices rose to an all-time high on Thursday, as the Fed policymakers indicated they still expect to reduce interest rates by three-quarters of a percentage point by the end of this year, 2024, despite recent high inflation readings. Investors are now awaiting U.S. core personal consumption expenditure price, uh, which is due on Friday, to see if that could alter the Fed's projections of three rate cuts for this year. Spot gold is expected to break support at 2,161 per ounce and fall into a $2,147 and 2,151,000 uh, range. Well, we'll come to Nigeria now. The federal government has initiated criminal proceedings against Binance, which is a prominent cryptocurrency exchange platform. The charges were filed on Friday, March the 23rd, at the Federal High Court in Abuja by the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Uh, the lawsuits implicate Binance with a four-count charge of tax evasion accusation joined with the crypto company as second and third defendants in the suit are Tigrain Gambarian and Nadine Ostawala, both senior executives of Binance, currently under the custody of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. The charges levied against Binance include non-payment of value-added tax company, uh, company income tax, failure to file tax returns, and complicity in aiding customers to evade taxes. 
through its platform. In the suit, the federal government also accused Binance of failure to register with FIRS for tax purposes and contravening existing tax regulations within the country. One of the counts in the lawsuit pertains to Binance's alleged failure to collect and remit various categories of taxes to the Federation as stipulated by Section 40 of the FIRS Establishment Act 2007 as amended. The charges further detail a specific instances where Binance purportedly violated tax laws such as failing to issue invoices for VAT purposes, thus obstructing the determination and payment of taxes by subscribers. And now news that Nigeria's public debt has increased by 10.7% to 97.34 trillion naira in the fourth quarter of 2023 from 87.91 trillion has been raising concerns. However, the Special Advisor on Economic Matters, Mr. Tokwe Fashua, who was a guest on Business Morning earlier today, says that the fact that majority of the new borrowings are coming from the domestic front should calm nerves, even as the government seeks to fund technology in the country. I would actually favor domestic debt any day. And, and I think what's also very important is this. If we look at um, the countries that we try to emulate in Europe, America and what have you, you know, those countries have their debts grounded domestically. Um, most of their debts are war debts, you know, war bonds that were issued a long time ago, you know, sometimes 100, 200 years ago. Uh, so there's, there's the fact that your own people must build your country uh, rather than always running abroad to go and get very expensive uh, foreign debt. You know, it's important for us. And I think that's a philosophy that we would also still have to pursue. We haven't done that that's even well enough. The fact that, uh, you know, we have to appeal to our own people to, borrow, to lend money to the government of, the, of, of uh, to, to their own government for the development of their country. So, um, but uh, yes, I think also in terms of crowding out, what we're looking at is a bigger pie to share, a bigger GDP, meaning that the banks are doing incredibly well as well. The banks are doing incredibly well, and I don't think uh, the government has started to crowd out anyone. Well, still staying in Nigeria now, the Chartered Institute, the Bankers of Nigeria, is asking practitioners to practice professionalism in carrying out their duties as this and exhuming uh, transparency is going to attract not just capital, but also the development which Nigeria so desperately needs. Professionalism are more likely to be considered for promotion and leadership role, thereby enhancing the sustainability of their career over time. Short of saying that there is no shortcut to having to build a sustainable career. On that end, ethics and professionalism stand as pillars within the financial services industry and the entire ecosystem, serving as the bedrock upon which trust, reliability, credibility are built. In recent years, the financial services industry has faced numerous challenges and controversies that have underscored the critical need for a renewed focus on ethics and professionalism. Instances of ethical behavior, neglected violation and breaches of law, have continued to be major issues that we continue to contend with. High profile cases of misconduct and infraction have not only resulted in financial loss, but also have injured the nature of this reason for. Now, financial officers uh, in the sector, both in the private and the public, to practice professionalism. And, of course, uh, we're going to stay more on that. And, more importantly, it's NPC. The meeting is ongoing even as we speak. Tomorrow, we hope to get the decision. You know that the studio will be open right here to give you the live uh, feed of that decision by the central bank, as well as we're having our panelists right here who will join in to dissect some of the factors in consideration just one month 
after the last MPC meeting and rates were raised by 400 basis points. What has that been doing to the economy? Are, are we on the path of taming inflation? Uh, we'll discuss all of that tomorrow, so you don't want to miss it. Studio opens at 1 p.m. and then we'll join in for the uh, decision and then follow up with that. So now let's take a short break. When we come back, oh, we'll start that conversation on the MPC decision or conversation. Perhaps we will be able to hear a little bit of what's going on at the meeting as we speak. That's after the break. Do stay with us. Welcome back to Watching Business Incorporated right here on Channel Television. Well, let's uh, perhaps get a little bit of tips of what might be going on, conversations going on at the MPC, at the CBN headquarters in Abuja. Well, uh, joining us for that conversation is Mr. Johnson Chiku. is the Chief Executive Officer of Kauri Asset Management. Mr. Chiku, good afternoon and thank you so much for your time. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. So a little bit told me that you have some connections from wires connected to the CBN headquarters. And you could tell us what they are discussing at this time. Well, it's basically we're going to be uh, second guessing them uh, based on the economic fundamentals of the country. And we believe that uh, the factors we'll be discussing are the same factors they will be taking into consideration in arriving at their decisions. Mm. So um, it's just about a month since the last decision we saw that uh, 400 basis points cut. Do you think there will be another, uh, not cut, I beg your pardon, hike? Please. <laughs> yeah. So do you think there will be another hike um, as we speak? Are they planning to tell us another hike tomorrow? Uh, or do you think they will say, oh, let's hold on and see the impact of the last decision, seeing that it was an aggressive move? Well, what I think is that uh, the most appropriate thing to do uh, is that they should hold rates at current levels. Because it's what we call in economic time lag effect. The decision they took on 26th and 27th of February are yet to be fully manifested on, on the economy. So if you take another decision now, you can't say they have weighed fully the impact of the decision you took a month ago. Remember that um, the MP MPC meeting is supposed to be held every two months. And this time around, we're holding it a month apart. And even as the two very contractionary measures, one, they increased the, um, the uh, monetary policy rate by 400 basis points from 18.75% to 22.75%. They tightened liquidity in the banking system from 32.5% uh, liquidity ratio to 45% liquidity ratio, uh, uh, card reserve ratio. And they maintain liquidity at a ratio of 30 percent. This uh, impact of this are going to be multifaceted as it relates to one fighting inflation, stabilizing the exchange rate, and slowing down productive activities. The impact on productive activities is yet to be felt because of this conversion cycle or asset conversion cycle of most businesses. So you, have, you will not see that already on the level of productive activities, level of demand. So I think the most appropriate thing to do is wait and see the impact, the full impact of the policy they took on February 26th and 27th. Uh, we are seeing the impact on exchange rates. Uh, we will not see the impact on inflation. Hopefully we are going to see the impact on inflation after some time when uh, traders begin to uh, re-import or replenish their stock. We are going to see that in the impact on productive activity, maybe in 90 days when uh, the demand would have slowed down or uh, consumer uh, producers would not be able to go to the banks to borrow and then uh, go back into productive activities. So to this full weight is uh, fully measured. I think the appropriate thing for them to do is to hold rates at current levels. Hmm. So you, you did mention that we know that normally, you know, even before now, the meetings used to be bi-monthly. But I, I guess because of, I mean, the rate of inflation, uh, we've seen the rate of increase from January to February. Uh, well, I say it's, not, it's, it's not slowing down, which is, which is scary. And um, you, you are suggesting that the rates be held. Uh, but looking at other, um, other movements, you talked about the FX for instance, we've seen the Naira gain uh, for a couple of days, perhaps encouraging and, and all of that. Um, don't you think that, I mean, as the governor said in the last meeting, perhaps it's good to handle inflation first before thinking of growth? 
Okay, uh, let's look at it in the first place. I think one of the motivations for holding the rate uh, today and tomorrow is because they want to restore to the normal periods when MPC holds. You know, remember, remember the MPC holds January, March, May, July, September, November. So I think they want to restore to that uh, timing. Um, so I think that might be the primary reason because we know, we all know that um, the full impact of the this police decision they took in February would have been fully effect. Uh, as it relates to uh, inflation um, uh, rate, which moved 31.7% in the month of February, remember inflation is many year on year uh, price movement. So the February inflation was based on price changes between February 2024 and the price levels as of February 2023. So you can clearly see that the policy they took or the policy decision they took on February 27th had no impact, had no relationship with the February inflation rates because that measured what price levels, price changes between February 2023 and February 2024. So that having said that, the, there are some uh, variables that could have been, that could be impacted immediately when critical decisions of the very severe nature they took uh, are taken. For instance, the issue of exchange rates. Uh, when you withdraw liquidity from the system, automatically there won't be liquidity for businesses. And that would mean that those who have not need FX to import goods will no longer have the uh, available naira liquidity to buy the FX. So you're going to see a slowdown in demand for FX and appreciation in the exchange rate. Those um, changes may be quite short in terms of their manifestation, but there are some that will take a longer time to manifest. Like I talk of the impact on productive activities. The trader, the business, the, the manufacturer who needs to assess loan from the bank, we have to go to the bank to assess the loan. Probably he find out that he can handle at thirty percent, and he realized that his his uh, price or market price will not absorb a cost of fund of thirty percent. So he, he, he refuses to borrow, and and therefore refuses to produce more. But he still has stock in the warehouses, so he will continue to sell his old stock. And then you will not see the impact of a slowdown in productive activities immediately. It's only when he exhausts those stocks you realize that he, there's no stock again. And at that point, if he has to borrow and must produce, he has to produce at a higher cost. So those are the, some of them will have longer lag effects. Um, in terms of inflation, you are going to see uh, the material slowdown in economic activities. Uh, and then you have to look at a slowdown in the month of March which will not have so much happen because people are still selling old stock. Maybe you begin to see a slowdown on import-induced inflation in the month of April by those who are replacing those stocks and importing at a lower exchange rate. So this fully part will take some time to achieve. But like the Monetary Policy Committee said, they want to prioritize uh, uh, management of inflation at the expense of productive activity because they believe that you need a stable level of prices to have productive activities. But they also said something that is very fundamental. They said that the inflationary pressure we are facing today are partly uh, structural in nature, one of which is that food production has actually slowed down in the major food base of the country. And because of insecurity, you need to address that as a core, at the core of the inflationary pressure we are facing today. If you don't address that, all these measures we are taking will not see a material improvement in inflation if you don't address food inflation. Mm. But with all of this now, do you see the CBN's uh, targets of about 21% of inflation? Do you see it happening this year? I think that would be a tough call. Uh, like I said, the major driver of inflation in the country is food inflation. We, if we continue to drive down economic activities and are able to achieve a lower exchange rate, as we have seen in the past few days, you may see a reduction in fuel per cost, uh, which is a major cost component in, in terms of Nigeria's inflation transmission. Uh, but ultimately, more than 60% of Nigeria's basket of consumer price index is driven by food, accounted by food. So you need to address that. If you don't address that, uh, to achieve a 21% uh, inflation rate this year will be a tough call. Mm. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson Chiku, our Chief Executive Officer of Cowrie Asset Management. I guess we'll have to wait till tomorrow and hear the announcements or their decision. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, so now let's head to other African countries and see what's happening there. Uh, beginning, or, all right. I, I think before we head to the African country, let's just do the markets and then we'll head to the African countries with Aniti Edit.
Yes, uh, good afternoon, Nini. Good afternoon. I was just trying to get my market figures. Uh, you know, first, we're all preparing for the end of uh, the first quarter. Everyone's all busy, including my guests. So, now let's start first um, with the uh, trading the Africa, as we usually call it here. At intraday, it was all mostly negative sec sentiment. Take a look at uh, Nigeria's stock market 0.14% down. Uh, but um, uh, still within the 104,000 level. Of course, we had two positive sessions last week, but then three sessions, no thanks to shell sell pressure by MTN as well as some other stocks that pulled the market back into the red territory. But still, 0.4% uh, year-to-date um, uh, performance is not, not too bad for that market. And now look at uh, South Africa, also in the red, 0.39%. Of course, for Nigeria's stock market, we had lost more than 240 billion naira. Let's move over to the other side of the African market, where we see Egypt being in the green, while Kenya closed Friday uh, with a massive 2.20% increase. Now, let's talk about Nigeria. We're talking about the outlook for this week. Everyone has been talking about it. The MPC meeting, of course, we have two other African countries holding MPC meetings. Today, as we speak, um, Ghana's central bank will be, hold, will be giving us the, 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 the outcome of their MPC meeting. So, for that, that market, and then for, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the South Africa stock market, for the South Africa's economy, the MPC will be unveiling its own MPC meeting for tomorrow. But let's take a look at what the outlook for this week is. At the bonds market, we anticipate domestic and global monetary policy administrations and sustained imbalance uh, in the demand and supply dynam dynamics to keep the yields on the high side, that's in the short term. Now, for the other side of what to look out for, for Nigeria's stock market, well, okay, talking about the treasury bills, we expect that the sustained, analysts actually expect that sustained downward movement of yield is expected in the secondary segments, and then the CBN at the primary market auction, the last four, for the month of March, will be carried out on Wednesday, the 27th, and they're expected to roll over more than 161.3 billion Naira worth of maturities. So far, the, the CBN has been conducting some, a series of primary market auctions. Now, let's look at the outlook for Nigeria's equities market, which I talked about. The meeting is also expected to have an impact on uh, the, the, the sentiments in the domestic stock market, but we're also expecting that cautious trading uh, will, be, uh, will be dominating the market. Maybe for the rest, we have just four days in this week for the financial markets. Now let's talk to Peter Abe, equity trader at uh, Stambic IBCC Stock Brokers to give us details. Okay, so now for, for now, we may not be able to join Peter. So let's move over to the other sides of the market for the other, for the Middle East, where we see also negative, mostly negative sentiment for that market. The Abu Dhabi, Index 0.04%, just a tad there, 0.04% on the upside, while its counterpart there, the Dubai FM, it was in the red, 0.03%, almost the same margin, but on the other sides of their, uh, of their performance. Now, let's look at the Saudi Arabia Stock Exchange, 0.063% down, while the Qatar Stock Exchange, 1.20% in the red. Now, let's look at other sides of the market. Talking about the U.S. market, the world's biggest economy, where we see almost negative sentiment there. All, all across the three major averages, we're seeing uh, uh, very positive pictures last week. Now, first, uh, if actually, analysts are saying that the market is on track for its fifth consecutive month of gain. So, no doubt, this one, this what you see here is just just uh, just for the for the Monday uh, outlook. But that at the close of today's trading session, we'll be seeing how the market closes. But so far, the gains that we saw last week for across the three major averages, they were fueled by the Federal Reserve's latest remark that maintained central bankers' uh, rate cutting timeline for this year, as well as investors' ongoing enthusiasm for tech stocks amid the AI-powered rally. Now, that's it for the U.S. market. Now, let's move over to the uh, Asian market. Also, not too good, not, not a pretty picture for there because, of course, they're, they're taking a look at so many uh, uh, digesting regional inflation numbers across uh, uh, the, the Singapore, uh, across uh, Malaysia. Uh, they, they, they both released uh, the inflation report, which came in higher than expected today. So for Monday, uh, many of the Asian stock markets, they're already closed, about seven hours and eight hours way ahead of us. So they're, they're, they're closed for the day and we'll be resuming later today. So that's it for that market. Let's look at the other side of that market where we see the Shanghai Composite. 
0.71% in the red, while the lone gainer there was the Australia's ASX 200, Australia's top 200 companies listed on the Australian Stock Exchange in the green, more than half of a percent in the green. So for, that's it for those markets, uh, Any. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the equities market, but tomorrow we will be looking at the um, the fixed income market as well as some other markets for the outcome of the MPC meeting. All right, Anitia, thank you so much. Pleasure. All right, let's move uh, to London now and see what's happening there. We hear that Ofgem is considering what they call dynamic limit based on time of the day. Okay, I wonder how that looks like. But we have uh, Juliana Olainka, of course, uh, corresponding to the London studio. Hi, Juliana. Good afternoon. What was this dynamic limit based on the time of day? I know it's about energy pricing. Good afternoon, Annie. Well, that's what we're going to be finding out, hopefully this week, as you quite rightly said, from Ofgem, which is the UK's energy regulator. And this is all about um, the energy price cap, which has been in place in this country for about five years. And the intention of bringing it into fruition is to make sure that wherever you are in the country, whatever your salary is, that you would be able to afford uh, to pay for your energy bills at um, a decent rate. And it was going pretty well. I think um, Ofgem only used to change the price cap about once or twice a year. But then, of course, we had the invasion of Ukraine by Wash Russia, and that turned around our energy security. And there was a time when we were paying about £1,900 a year uh, for our energy supplies. It went up to about £4,000 a year during um, the crisis. In fact, that's one of the reasons why inflation um, went to double digits in 2022 because of energy security. Um, it's since, of course, come down. Liz Truss um, and then um, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, put in place an energy uh, price cap guarantee, which ensured we wouldn't pay so much. But that's also since waned. And so now it is time for discussions about how Brits are going to be paying for their energy supplies, again, using the same remit that they put in place at the beginning to ensure that we're not paying too much. Now, in April, um, the energy price cap is going to be reduced significantly again to, I think, about £1,400. So going back to normal times. But one of the reasons why the energy regulator has put up set up this consultation is because they have noticed, of course, patterns in the way consumers use their energy, particularly times, as you quite rightly said, going back to what you said at the start initially, Innie, it is getting slightly warmer. It is spring, although it's still pretty cold here in the UK. Uh, but they notice, of course, if you're somebody who's at work nine to five, you're not using your energy, are you? You're just probably using it for an hour in the morning and then in the evening. So these are parts of um, the parameters that um, are going to be discussed in this discourse. Like I said, the price cap will reduce again in April for at least one quarter. But how is it going um, to be adjusted as the year goes on? That's what we're going to get from the consultation. I don't think we're going to get Get that um, until after Easter, I think. Okay, we'll wait. We'll wait for that. Uh, so, what else are we looking forward to uh, for this week? Apart from Good Friday and, of course, Easter Sunday, it's a really quite weak this week. Mostly because, of course, we've got that bank holiday on Friday, so it's just a four-day working week for the city. I suppose the big one to mention is Thursday, which is going to be the final data from the Office for National Statistics looking at GDP for the final quarter, which we know was the quarter that put Britain into the shallow recession that we are, so in a technical recession, because we had um, two quarters of contraction of GDP. And now the data that we got a couple of months ago showed that GDP in the final quarter fell by 0.1%. But alas, economists are expecting the revised data to show that the economy actually contracted slightly more by 0.3%, which is not great. Um, but then again, we did have um, Andrew Bailey, the Bank of England governor, after the MPC decision on Thursday, saying that they're, of course, looking at forensic data and they don't believe that the, the shallow recession is any deeper uh, than was once feared. So that's a good thing. So perhaps the economists may be wrong and 0.3% will actually remain 0.1%. What We shall have to wait and see. Apart from 
um, the Princess of Wales conspiracy theories and the leadership tussle um, at uh, number 10 as we head into an election. It is very quiet week in London this week, isn't it? Yeah, well, I guess after the Easter, we'll have all the excitement that uh, we're missing out this week. All the excitement at the market, how's that at this time? Yeah. Yeah, not great, actually. I suppose the biggest faller from the Blue Chip Index today is Kingfisher. Kingfisher, not really a popular uh, name, but they are the parent company of the home improvement retailer B&Q, which is a really household name in the UK if you ever wanted to kind of refurbish your home. They issued this morning their third profit warning in the past six months to investors and that's because their profits over the past year have actually fallen by 25 percent which is quite significant actually um, i suppose it, it just goes to show when people were staying at home more in 2022 people are spending so much more and in investing um in their household backgrounds of course if you're on zoom in you want it to look as prim and proper as possible now people aren't really using a uh, zoom that much they're going back into the office and that's really affected uh, their bottom line i think france in particular they said they're going to um be axing quite a few jobs that's reflected in the uk blue chip index and intraday because the all share it's down it's down by 0.35 percent the FTSE 100 that's down two by 0.32% and the FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's down by 0.64% at intraday. In the currencies market, the British pound is also trading up, up against the US dollar by 0.20%, up to against the euro by 0.10% and up against the Japanese yen by 0.18%. I was saying to Laddie last week, Innie, that uh, the British pound has actually uh, been the highest performing currency mm. um, of the year this year, which is um, really good news considering how much it dipped uh, below Brexit. So, uh, yeah, good, good, good bounce for well, the pound. Well, Julian, I have to warn you, it's still early in the year. The Naira can be the best performing. We're working on it. It is. We're praying for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's go to Berlin, uh, where over the weekend it was an emotional one for football lovers uh, as they saw a switch from uh, uh, German sportswear, that's the sponsors of their team, from German sportswear maker Adidas to Nike as the sponsor. Wow, I guess everybody follows the money, but Lars uh, joins us now. Hi, Lars, good afternoon. So uh, why, what's the need of this change? Is it just about where the funding is coming from? Yeah, thanks for having me, Ini. Well, let me tell you, it was quite a shock indeed for fans. Nike is reportedly paying the German team 100 million euros per year. And that was about twice as much as Adidas had been paying them. So when Economy Minister Robert Habeck criticized the deal over the weekend, uh, saying he would have appreciated some loyalty and economic patriotism from the German Soccer Federation, they had a quick response. Had Nike just outbid the competitor by a few million, they would have likely stuck with their old partner. That is what management said. But given the massive amount Nike was willing to fork over, that was just not an option. It is a painful now for German fans because there's just so much history there. Adidas became a sponsor of the German national team for the World Cup in 1954. And that was, of course, way before sponsorship was even a thing. The company pretty much paid the expenses for the team shortly after. World War II when there was no money for sports. Germany won that World Cup then in Switzerland and it was a huge moment for the war-torn country and it helped propel Adidas to legendary status as well at a time when that company was just a relatively small shoemaking firm in a little Bavarian town. Yeah, well, I guess uh, you follow the money and not the loyalty. But what does this mean? What are some of the implications? Well, it tells us how some sports are playing a different role than they used to. Football was long Adidas territory, not least because the company had been involved for so long and had been helping the sport develop. Also, football was long the number one sport in Europe with not much business in the US, for example. And that has changed. Soccer is growing across the pond and also in Asia and in some other markets. And Nike has long gotten into the game after spending decades focusing 
mostly on other sports like basketball, baseball, track and field. And uh, looking at Nike's philosophy in general, they don't play for second. They're playing to win. And while the German team has not been that strong in recent years, Germany is definitely one of the biggest markets worldwide. And it's one that was just too big for Nike to ignore. And they came in at the right moment, it seems. In a friendly this weekend, uh, Germany actually beat France 2-0. That was a much stronger showing than anyone had been expecting, although they were still playing in Adidas because the switch to Nike won't happen until 2027. All right, Lars. So let's look at the market. How's that looking? Well, it looks like it'll be a slow start into the new trading week. Asian markets are slightly down on Monday, but there's not too much action there either. And European shares aren't picking up any signals. Uh, not much on the docket here for today either. So we're likely focusing on the U.S. on Monday, where at least we will get some data this morning, mostly from the real estate sector. There will also be some uh, Fed speakers that are scheduled to appear. And any kind of Fed talk has recently been uh, pretty good for markets, I would say. Remember just last week, Fed Chief Jerome Powell gave a strong commitment to interest rate cuts later this year, and it helped push markets higher. All right, Lars, thank you so much for that. Talk to you tomorrow. Now, the Pan-African Parliament, PAP, serving as the legislative branch of the African Union, has gathered for an extraordinary session at its headquarters in Midrand, South Africa. A key item on the agenda for this session is the election to fill vacant positions in the PAP Bureau, notably positions such as the President, the First Vice President and Fourth Vice President of the Bureau that are currently vacant. Meanwhile, the Nigerian representatives at PAP underscore the vital role of PAP African Parliament in addressing challenges confronting the African continent we have, uh, of course, our correspondent is there and will feed us with more information in due course. All right, uh, now let's uh, go to that story. I don't know from which divide we'll look at it. That's the sale of the National Bank of Kenya. We did hear last week that Access Co. has acquired the uh, uh, National Bank of Kenya. Uh, let's get the Kenya perspective at this time. I know back here in Nigeria, we did see some movement in the shares price of Access Co. Wonder if that was connected. But let's hear what the Kenyans have to say. We have joining us for this, uh, Mr. Limo Taboy. He's an economist in Nairobi, the capital of Kenya. Mr. Taboy, good afternoon and thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Amy. So when we hear uh, a private uh, sector bank in Nigeria acquiring a national bank of Kenya, it kind of rings a bell because... You know, when you say it's a national bank, help us to understand the dimensions and the implications of this, especially uh, when you call a bank the National Bank of Kenya. Well, National Bank of Kenya, it's about, was started in, I think, the late 60s. It was a state-owned bank, and it has been one of the, one of the few state-owned banks. And... It was a private, it became, became private later on, was listed on the stock exchange until it was bought by Kenya Commercial Bank in 2019, and it was delisted in 2021. But so it's now 100% owned by K, the KCB Group. So now it's now owned by Access Co. So KCB Group has shepherded it for about five years. They took it over kind of in a, some government arrangements to midwife the, the bank when it was in trouble. Uh, they've gone through with it for a few years. They've been invested about $100 million to right the ship. Um, but even as when they gave the Q3 results in November, the board of KCB said the bank was under review. It was their only non-performing subsidiary or underperforming subsidiary and a decision was imminent and it was kind of a quite a surprise to get the news last week when all the banks were given their uh, full year 2023 results and kcb signed a deal with a uh, access bank to 
to sell National Bank of Kenya to Access Bank. So what does this tell us about the financial landscape of Kenya? Um, so most of the banks who are releasing the results, they are coming off the two, three years of, after COVID. And there's quite a bit of recovery. Uh, quite a few banks still have non-performing assets. Yeah, certain sectors were quite hit, uh, corporate loans, manufacturing sector. And KCB as a group has diversified its business where um, 35 percent of its business comes from outside the country and as a group K kcb has got non-performing assets and all the subsidiaries are below 10 percent um, kcb itself is about 20 percent a national bank despite all the the moves done to sort out their balance sheet and uh, the bad debts they were they were mildly profitable for most of the years but some court issues have caught up with them and i think the board of kcb made a decision that it wants to invest in its performing subsidiaries and made a decision to let go of the national bank of kenya all right so um we you know the rest of africa has been admiring the pace at which kenya has been going when it comes to digital uh, banking and fintechs you know, and trying to uh, increase, accelerate financial inclusion. Uh, and it's these same banks that are doing this. Isn't it feeding into their profitability? They're, they're all doing well in that aspect. I think National Bank of Kenya, um, even though it was and is, is private, it still does a lot of business on behalf of the government of Kenya. Um, they have got very strategic branches. Uh, it's quite a huge network uh, at border points, at uh, airports. Um, I think most people who pay taxes through bank channels find themselves paying through National Bank of Kenya. So it has quite some good uh, li liquidity capabilities, which will now move on to the new owner when the deal is concluded. All right, thank you so much uh, for helping us to understand some of those implications and the details behind that sale of uh, the National Bank of Kenya. Uh, Mr. Timo uh, Taboy, for your uh, thoughts this afternoon. Thank you, Ine. Good day. Good afternoon. All right, just before we head back uh, to some other African countries, uh, there's, a, there's a news breaking now that the chief executive of Boeing is stepping down, yes, the same Boeing, as the embattled U.S. plane maker makes a string of changes to its senior management. Uh, his name is Dave Callon, uh, Mr. David Callon, who joined the firm in January 2020, but would depart at the end of this year. In a statement, Boeing said that Mr. Callon would continue to lead through the year in order to maintain stability as it seeks to recover from one of the most crisis hit periods in its history. The plane maker has been engulfed in scandals since part of its aircraft fell off during an Alaska Airlines flight in January. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, the Boeing CEO is stepping down, but he's still there till the end of the year. You get more of this, more details and conversations around this. Uh, if you just stay to uh, stick right here on channels television. Now uh, to some other African countries. Now we move to Ethiopia, where the Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, has unveiled plans to allow foreign nationals to buy real estate and to open up retailing to international companies. Currently, foreigners are forbidden from own owning either residential or commercial buildings. But the announcement came as Africa's second most populous country, with about 120 million people, seeks to shore up its finances. In addition, Mr. Abe said that the government uh, will ease restriction in the retail sector and open it up to international players, and not just Ethiopians. Uh, still in Africa, before we head to the crypto space in Senegal, uh, we know that uh, election has been hot there. We have our correspondent, Kela Megua. I'm sure you've seen how the uh, bulletins and even lunchtime politics. Now, looking at what's going on following the election or the politics going there, Senegal's dollar bonds are among the worst performers in emerging markets. Uh, that's uh, the rating as on Monday, as investors weighed on a chance of an opposition candidate 
winning the presidency after an election uh, yesterday, Sunday. The yield on bonds due 2048 climbed 12 basis points to 9.93, and uh, that's with their price equivalent to 71.70 on the dollar. The yield on notes maturing in 2033 uh, rose 19 basis points to 9.36. That's the highest since November, sending price falling to 81.75. Meanwhile, supporters of Senegal's presidential candidate, Basiru Diomaye Fai, have taken to the streets of the capital, Dakar, in celebration as early results from that election uh, emerges. Now let's head to the crypto space now with Ladi Williams. Ladi, quite a lot of drama yeah. going on around the cryptocurrency area in Nigeria. Some things, uh, news you cannot confirm going right. on. What we know is that we are awaiting the hearing dates uh, where the Binance executives will be charged to court at the Federal High Court in Abuja. Yeah, definitely a lot happening right now with Binance. And to think, well, the biggest cryptocurrency exchange is being you know, hammered all over the world at this time, even the U.S., just a couple of countries that are still quite you know, lenient you know, to them at this time, but still a developing story at this point. So many reports we can't confirm you know, at this time, but we're going to be speaking um, to one of my guests See if now. we can confirm. To find out, you know, we can <laughs> confirm some things yeah. you know, at this point. But let's uh, start off now. Let's look at the sentiment um, in the market right now. Um, it's, it, it's greedy. It's still a greedy market. No more extreme greed. Um, for now, we've seen a big pullback um, looking at the fear greed um, index um, at this point. So who knows where it's going to be heading next? Uh, maybe neutral at some point. Who knows? Could see fear at uh, this time. Let's look at the top headlines um, in the crypto space. Now we see um, Europe's new anti money laundering um, legislation. That's rattled some um, crypto investors right there in Europe. We see um, they recently approved the majority of the EU Parliament's uh, leadership committee. And that's triggered concerns right now about privacy, you know, amongst uh, EU crypto um, investors. So uh, they, they stated that cash payments exceeding about 10,000 euros or anonymous cash transactions beyond 3,000 euros will be prohibited at this time. Uh, the ban also extends to payments made from self-custody uh, wallets. So those wallets are not left out. Then Nigeria files um, tax evasion charges against uh, Binance Exchange. We're talking about Binance um, just a few months ago. Then uh, we also see a lot of outflows right now, uh, 58,000 Bitcoin pulled out of Coinbase, uh, Coinbase Pro, uh, this, and that's a U.S. exchange there. We'll find out why um, that's all happening. But joining us now, uh, let's speak to Obi Naiwuno, President, Stakeholders in Blockchain Association. Join us via Zoom. Great to have you on the show. Hello, Obi. Yeah, good to be here. F fantastic. So, uh, another, yeah, another day, another Binance um, story. Um, how's your association seen the latest um, update right now with uh, one of the executives on the run or out of the country? Well, we, like other Nigerians, we are greeted with the news today, and um, we haven't had any other information apart from what we have seen in the news currently. Uh, we are still also waiting for the confirmations and um, information on that, as the news has said. Uh, but one of the things that we are looking at is how that we can be able to manage the whole situation of what is happening to the um, crypto sector right now and of course with the national interest and um, security as it may be affected in any way. Uh, recently, uh, about a week ago, the SEC released an update on the rules for special asset service providers and digital asset exchanges. That has been a current uh, uh, issue on deliberation within the association now. And uh, we are also giving our feedback to the regulator on some of the things that are contained in that document, how it affects the industry, how it enables the growth of the sector, and also how it encapsulates the protection of the interest 
of the nation and our economy and of course the concerns of the local industry players uh, participators and operators and what we want to see is a situation where the customers the users consumers and of course the investors interest are protected you know we want to have a, an accurate and conscious customer and investor protection okay. and also we want to see how innovation thrives within that um, um, framework of that but it's an unfortunate situation at the moment but we are hoping that we will be able to reach uh, a very okay you know good agreement between both parties yeah all right, but, but very quickly before I let you go, in a few seconds, just um, talk to me about this charge, about tax, uh, tax evasion charge um, leveled uh, against uh, Binance at this time. I know they're a very rich exchange. They should be able to pay tax in Nigeria, shouldn't they? Uh, you know, the issue of tax, ta uh, tax taxation as it is, is very pretty simple and clear all over the world. Now, if you are operating a business within a certain geographical location with defined rules and laws that governs business operation and of course performing a civic responsibility like taxation, it is something that you do not need to be told about. It is an obligation that you perform without being reminded or induced to do it and so i feel that it is a civic responsibility that should be carried out by all businesses and entities operating within a geographical location right. okay. that has rules and regulations governing it just like nigeria right so if there is that like the firs filed that binance has been offering services to Nigerians and doing business in Nigeria, but haven't been paying tax in Nigeria, then if that claim is very right, then they should be held to pay taxation for right. the businesses conducted within this geographical location. Right. So it's a civic responsibility that everybody owes to the government. All right. Thank you so much. It was great having a perspective. Obi Naiwono, President Seban. Thank you. Thank you, Gladi. All right. All right. So, any, there you have it. He's saying Binance should pay uh, a tax at this time because they do make a lot of money from, you know, trading volume and all of that. But now it depends on how much trading volume Nigeria, you know, provides to them. You know, okay, Ladi, so let's not get ahead of ourselves and let's hear the hearing dates. Exactly. And then, of course, trust channels. We're going to follow it up and then bring every details. Exactly. Pros and cons and every side of it. Right. Thank you so much. And we'll also say thank you so much for being a part of Business Incorporated today. It's just Monday. A lot of things happening, even though it's a shortened week. But we'll do it again tomorrow. I'm Ini John McCarthy at 10 p.m. for the Stock Market Reports.